Bible if you'd like to follow along to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8, and we will begin reading in verse 30. And we will read verse 30 through verse 36. As he spake these words, many believed on him. And then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I'd like to share with you this afternoon what I consider is a most wonderful gospel truth, but I think it is to some degree beyond our ability to really apprehend, to really grasp it, to really understand it even though we have spiritual discernment, even though we have uh, some spiritual knowledge. Because this, this wonderful constant truth we're going to consider is so high, so magnificent. It's a truth that God's people have known down through the ages, despite their outward circumstances, Besides their little faith at times, besides the fact that they were sometimes judged by others. I think of Abraham. Abraham the patriarch standing at his tent door looking out across that massive desert and filled with uncertainty as to what God was going to do with him tomorrow. He had God's promises. He had faith, but there was this element of uncertainty. And as you know anything about the life of Abram, subsequently Abraham, God moved him in many different locations. God did many things with him. There was uncertainty. Think about Joseph. Joseph, who was falsely accused, badly mistreated by his brethren. I think of Joshua and Caleb, those two who suffered at the hands of the misdeeds of others. You recall that Joseph and Caleb had, excuse me, Joshua and Caleb had to suffer being with the Israelites in the desert for another generation because everybody else did not believe God. Those two did, but they had to endure that that chastisement upon everybody else. I think of David. David who committed very, very grievous sin, but then restored by the grace of God. Renewed favor. Renewed fellowship. I think of the Apostle Paul. He knew this tremendous truth. Though he knew the gospel of free grace, he was laboring. He said, I would very gladly spend and be spent. He was always doing something. But oftentimes there was no outward visible fruit or results of what he did. I think about you. You should know this truth that these saints of yesteryear knew. Whether you have uncertainty in your life, like Abraham, 
whether you have ever been falsely accused, badly mistreated, or at the very least, misunderstood, suffering because of the misdeeds of others, or perhaps like David who committed this very terrible sin in your past life, a sin that your mind cannot shake, and, and that which the accuser of the brethren keeps trying to remind you of sin being that touchstone of our relationship to Christ relative to the sin being ours but Christ being the one that has borne it away. Maybe not a terrible sin but maybe a quantity of sins because you were saved later in life. Again this truth which perhaps we cannot fully apprehend or appreciate because it is so magnificent, yet it should be prized very highly by us. And it's the wonderful truth of spiritual freedom, spiritual liberty. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Wonderfully free, completely free eternally free, divinely made free, free indeed, free as God defines freedom. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. As you can see from the outline, I have divided our consideration this afternoon into four segments. First of all, some remarks on the context. Secondly, freedom from what? Thirdly, the Christian's many freedoms or freedom unto. And then in the last place, a couple of questions by way of application. First of all, a few brief comments on the context. I'd like to go verse by verse and, and just fill in a little bit of what is going on here. In verse 30, we read, as he spoke these words, many believed on him. When Jesus Christ spoke, he had an authority. His divinity leaked through, I believe, a little bit. The common consensus about him was never a man spoke like this man. And it seems as though whenever he spoke, there was a demonstrative result. Some believed, some hated, some disbelieved, some had questions. Here, the scripture says, many believed, and it's the Greek word, to have faith in. From the context, we know there, was other, there were others who did not believe. And as you know, as you read through the Gospels, why was it that many followed him? Some followed to see miracles. Some wanted to eat of loaves and fishes. Some had wrong expectations. Some followed simply because other people were following, and that's what they thought they should do. Our Lord comes to the crux of the matter in the next verse, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, he said this, If you continue in my word, then you are disciples, my disciples, indeed. Continuance in God's Word doesn't make a true disciple, it marks a true disciple. Jesus was not telling these followers that if they exerted their own willpower, their efforts, their works, that if they did this, they were His disciples. But rather this was a mark or an evidence that they were His disciples disciples, if they abode in the truth, if they persevered in God's Word. God's Word, that Word that is living and abiding, penetrating and convicting, 
that word that comes with power and unction, that word that is like no other word that was ever shared in the history of time and in the universe. This word resident in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. Jesus was saying continuance in God's word was proof that that word started being divinely planted. James says this, he says, by his own will he begot us unto life by the word of truth. He put the seed of his word in our hearts, in our lives, James 1.18. And that's how we became born again. And if that word continues in you, Jesus was saying, you are my disciples. In verse 32, he continues the thought. He says, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Notice the connection between verse 32 and verse 36. The truth will make you free. The Son of Man will make you free. There's a correlation between Jesus Christ, the living Word, and the Word of God, that inscripturated Word, that written Word, the reality of that Word that you are holding in your lap. The statement by our Lord, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Again, this Greek word, it's, it's a word that is used in, in a wide variety of applications, but it encompasses all different ways of knowing, to learn, to get a knowledge of, to become known, to have knowledge as a possession, a real life possession. When our Lord says this, there is an inference. When He says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, the inference is, if you do not have the truth, you are not free. If you do not have His truth, you belong to somebody else. You are somebody else's servant. You're living in a different kingdom. You are not at liberty. You are bound. You are not free. You are enslaved. Now let me ask you a, a question. When Jesus says these two things, verse 32, and then subsequently when he says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free, is it not clear to you what the Lord is speaking about? Don't you understand where Christ is leading them, what he's trying to open up to them. But notice the response of those in verse 33. They answered him, well, we, we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? This statement by these Jewish people is very remarkable. And I'd like to note a few couple things. Number one, Jesus is speaking spiritually, but they are registering physically or naturally. In other words, they are not spiritually discerning spiritual truth. You knew what the Lord was talking about when we read the verses up to this point. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus Christ was talking about being free in his kingdom, freeborn as a citizen. In a civil sense, one who was not a servant or not a slave. One who was free exempt, unrestrained, under no obligation, and in an ethical sense, free from the yoke of the Mosaic law. So they were not spiritually discerning spiritual truth. They're thinking in the physical or the natural realm. Secondly, they are putting confidence in the flesh. 
not confidence in Christ or His Word. We be Abraham's seed. What's the obvious question? The Tracy Bible study hears me ask that ten times a night probably. What is the obvious question? When you, when you read some statements and you, you come upon truth in God's Word, obvious questions to me jump out of the page. My question would be, well, how many sons did Abraham have? Which seed are you from? Ishmael or Isaac? They didn't even qualify. They assumed that they would identify with that, that line of promise. Sadly, I think they are manifesting the fact they're from Ishmael's seed, spiritually speaking, at war with the righteous, not believers, not receptive to Christ and His kingdom. Galatians 4, 29 and following. At, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, way back then, even so it is now. They were placing confidence in the flesh and opening themselves up to, in fact, which bloodline are you owning? Thirdly, they make an error when they say, we were never in bondage to any man. The unbelieving person often does not accurately understand their condition, the state they are in, and they disregard the remedy of the gospel. Mm -hmm. They will put up arguments or rationale or excuses or some device of self-preservation. We were never in bondage to any man. How about when they were slaves in Egypt for 430 years? How about in the book of Judges where seven times God says He delivered them unto slavery to get their attention or as a chastisement? How about in 727 when Assyria took away the ten northern tribes? How about in 586 when Babylon took away the two southern tribes? How about the fact that right now they were under uh, the Roman yoke as they were speaking to our Lord? They were never in bondage. They were. So in the statement by these Jewish people, we see the irrationality of natural man. Inability to, to apprehend spiritual truth. Putting confidence in the flesh. And immediately putting up defenses, arguments, rationales, some reason why God's Word is not pertinent to them. Some reason why God's Word, they're, they're exempt from God's Word. Our Lord could have really taken them to task with a myriad of answers to their response that we've never been in bondage, but He does not. He tells them in verse 34, speaking more plainly, <coughs> Verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. He's referring to the regular practice, the habitual, natural course of unsaved man. He's not talking about the Christian who will sin every day of his life because we're in this, this, this corruptible body. The Christian sins but the non-Christian can do nothing but sin. The Christian sins, but he repents. The Christian hates his sin. The Christian understands what sin does. But the life of the unregenerate one is an unbroken chain, a course of sin. Being a sinner by nature, he is a sinner by practice. And then what does that lead to? Jesus says in verse 35. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, 
but the Son abides. Our Lord is becoming more focused and more plain in what He is speaking about. Though they were the natural descendants of Abraham, they were the servants of sin and should on that account be cast out. They were not the sons of promise, they were the sons of Ishmael. The sons of promise, Isaac, they could stay in the house because they're sons. Servants are temporary. Servants have tasks to do, to do and then they leave. Jesus says, a servant does not abide in the house. He has no right of inheritance. He has no continuance. He's not one of the family. Only the Son abides forever. To continue that thought from Galatians, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Our Lord paints, He frames, He encircles this truth that is so crystal clear. They are the servants of sin. They do not belong to Him. His Word is not in them. And then in verse 36, He offers this tremendous promise. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Or as the word literally reads, if therefore the Son you sets free, really free you are. If therefore the Son you sets free, free, really free you are. In truth, in reality, as a point of fact, as opposed to what is pretended, fictitious, false, or conjecture. He that is called of the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. So our Lord, in this very short passage, funnels down to this tremendous gospel promise and truth. The sun shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. Secondly, this afternoon, if we are free, what in fact are we free from? In the immediate context, we understand that Jesus is speaking to those who were primarily enslaved by sin, servants of sin. Sin as a rigorous, harsh task master. The reality and the principle of sin is significantly more expansive than the person on the street understands. The reality and the principle of sin is significantly and more expansive than most people believe or understand. Consequences, the principle of sin is multifaceted, it is expansive, it hedges man in, it is barrier upon barrier. Jesus is speaking to those who are under the dominion of sin. Again, the Christian commits sin. We do not teach sinless perfection, but for the Christian, he's not under the control of or the dominion of sin. Pastor Downing in his Baptist Catechism says this, sin possesses five realities, guilt, penalty, pollution, 
power and presence. Guilt, penalty, pollution, power, and presence. And it's from this significant and expansive principle and reality of sin that mankind needs to be rescued from, free from, set at liberty from. And thinking about being made free, free indeed by the Son of Man, let me illustrate the predicament this way. And I'd like to change the imagery from being enslaved to being in prison. And the scripture uses that analogy as well. If you were in prison, there would not simply be one single barrier between you and freedom. At the Jamestown prison, there are at least five concentric fences to keep people in. Some of those fences are electric fences. Some are extremely high. All of them have razor wire on the top. There are guard towers with guards having guns in them. There are guards stationed throughout the prison. There are roving guard patrols. There are video closed circuit cameras that many of them, and there's these main consoles where people can watch all these console, consoles to see what is happening. There is a multitude of salad ports and automatic locking doors. There's the cells themselves. Even the cell blocks and the buildings that make up that prison are oriented and constructed in such a way as to keep people in. When somebody is enslaved by sin, there is a multitude of concentric barriers keeping them enslaved. There are many ancillary things that are keeping them from freedom. That unregenerate person needs to be actually taken out of that environment, that kingdom, and transplanted into a different environment, a different kingdom. Paul said, we give thanks to the Father who has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and he has translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. Completely taken out of one kingdom and placed in another. True spiritual emancipation. So what has the Christian been delivered from? What has he been freed from? He's been freed from the curse of the law. The law requires perfection and perpetual obedience. It pronounces a curse against every transaction. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3 and verse 23 expresses the idea of close custody. When it says, before faith came, we were kept under the law and shut up until faith afterwards would be revealed. You have been freed from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth. Secondly, you've been freed from the power of sin. Sin has a power. Sin has infected every member of our bodies. Like a, a cancer or like a 
disease that courses through our entire being. And it has such of a power that again, Christ, and as we read in Romans 6, it has the imagery of being a task master. Whoever you yield your servants to obey, his servants you are, whether unto sin to death or unto obedience to righteousness. Those five realities of sin, guilt, penalty, pollution, power, and presence, each one is all-encompassing in their own right. So you've been delivered from the curse of the law, from the power of the sin. We, we can sum up those two, that you've been delivered from the condemnation of sin, the penalty of the law, and the wrath of God. So for you, there is therefore now no condemnation, because you are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. You've been freed from the tyranny of Satan. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26 in speaking about that we should not strive when we are presenting the gospel. He says we're trying to recover those who out of the snare of the devil have been taken captive by him at his will. Satan is a tyrant. Satan is a taskmaster. You've been freed from him. You have been freed from the fear of death. Hebrews speaks that through fear of death, we were all the lifetime subject to bondage. Fear of death because what happens after death? Either judgment or the unknown. As a matter of fact, you've been delivered from just that principle of fear in general. What was the first characteristic or trait of mankind that he exhibited when he committed just one sin? Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. I feared. There are so many barriers, so many concentric fences to true freedom, and every one of those Christ has destroyed to free you. There's so many other things, ignorance, error, the bondage of the will, moral inability, lack of those Christian fruits and graces that enable you as the Christian now to live above the world without anxiety, sadness, frustration, but those fruits and graces, love, joy, peace, patience, at least temper your responses and your reactions as you go through this world. Can, can you imagine, can, can you see the analogy of, let's say, a prison with so many things that are acting as a barrier between you and true freedom and what, in fact, Christ has done? Destroying, removing all of those. The Christian has been rescued. He has been set free, a freedom that is genuine and enduring and God originated. A freedom that is expansive. This is why Jesus said, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Thirdly, the Christians' many freedoms. The Christians' many freedoms. As you noted in your bulletin, the title of the message, Freed Unto Freedom. It turns out you were freed into the freedom of Christ or the liberty 
of Christ. You have been set free to enjoy and participate in the freedoms that God has so willed for your life. It would be tremendously wonderful if all Christ did was open up all those prison doors and let us go free. Freedom from the wrath of God. The curse of the law, sin, the penalty and power of sin, death, freedom from all those rigorous, hard, bad realities. But in fact, you have been freed into something or unto something. As one of the versions renders Galatians 5 and verse 1, For freedom Christ has set you free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For freedom Christ has set you free. I think Luke sums it up to the best this way. He says, we've been delivered from the hands of our enemies so that we can serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. What are the Christians' many freedoms that He's been delivered unto? Really, it's quite simple. It's quite simple. You've been free to be a child of God, a servant of God, a son of God. You've been freed into a freedom that is equal to being a new creation in Christ. You've been freed into a freedom that is commensurate with no longer being a stranger or a foreigner, but a fellow citizen with the saints and the household of God. You've been delivered into a freedom whereby God calls you a son, and if a son, an heir, and a joint heir through Christ. You have been delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Several years ago, one of the advertising taglines for one of the branches of the military was this, be all that you can be. Well, in God's economy, you've been put into a freedom so that you can be all that you can be in God's sight. You've been given, delivered into a freedom whereby you are a fellow citizen of the saints. And I'm not talking about us here. You're a fellow citizen with Abraham and David and the prophets and the apostles because there's one faith, one Lord, one spirit that binds us together. You've been delivered into a freedom to serve God. Do you know you can serve God acceptably? God accepts your service. It will never be perfect. But he accepts it for what it is, as a child serving his father. You've been freed into the freedom to now you can be a friend of God. You can be a son of God, a child of God, an heir of God. You have the absolute, complete freedom to approach God. Do we take that for granted? <laughs> Is it so familiar that we forget what is happening when we approach, we draw near unto God? We're not in the outer court or the inner court. We're drawing near unto Him, as Hebrews 10 says. You have the freedom to pray anywhere, anytime, knowing God hears your prayer. You could pray in a government building. You could pray at school. 
You have the freedom to worship God in the beauty of holiness. You have the freedom to serve God, to live unhindered as a child of God. None of these which you knew when you were outside of Christ. You have the freedom to not be under man's authority, to not be judged by man, to not be restricted or constricted as, as the cults do, trying to bind people's consciences. You have, listen to this one, you have the freedom to not sin. To not sin. When a sinner is saved, he is not free to follow the old bent of his old nature, lawlessness. He's been given a spiritual freedom to not sin. And again, as we read in Romans chapter 6, we have the freedom to obey gospel, have gospel obedience and uh, yield our members unto righteousness. And he says this. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, but now you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. And you have fruit unto holiness, even to everlasting life. You've been delivered out of bondage, out of captivity, out of servanthood, out of jail, and delivered into the field of freedom. It's a glorious freedom, a glorious liberty. Free, indeed. Let me close this afternoon with two applications in the form of two questions. The first question is to that, to you who are truly born, again, converted, you name the name of Christ in sincerity and truth. Jesus says, if the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Here is my question for you. Are you free indeed? Emphasis on free. Are you free indeed? This question is born out of the concern that I have in my mind as I meet many professing Christians in the prison, uh, on that side of the hill where I live, at work. They appear in some ways to not take that admonition of Galatians 5 and verse 1 for what it means when it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. They would never say they are going back under the law to merit righteousness, but I sense hints of incipient legalism and fear and becoming a man pleaser and, and partially free but not entirely free in Christ. Doing what others expect them to do. Not entirely free, set at liberty in Jesus Christ. And you know the Apostle Paul even had this brought into his life. When he says in Galatians, there were false brethren, unawares, they came in privately to spy out the liberty which we have in Christ so they might bring us back into bondage. Spying out the Apostle Paul's liberty, his freedom, to try to get him back into bondage, any bondage is the wrong bondage. You have been set entirely free, wonderfully free, eternally free, free as a son, free as an heir 
entirely free. Mark it down, friends. The Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit is, there is liberty. You can never overvalue what it means to be made, made free in Jesus Christ. His freedom will never be overthrown. It is a secure covenant ordered in all things and sure. It was determined in the eternal counsels of God. When Jesus Christ said you will be made free indeed, he meant what he said. If you are free, you are free indeed. Let no man try to bring you under some bondage. Let no principality or power or thing, even a well-meaning person, try to bring you under some kind of yoke or bondage or servant a servanthood that is not what it should be. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Or again, the literal rendering. If therefore the Son, you, sets free, you, free, really are. My second question is to everybody, I suppose. Jesus once again said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. My question is this. Are you free indeed? Now my emphasis is on the you. Are you free indeed? This was the very intent of why the Lord came. When he read that scripture in the temple, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because Jehovah God has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, note, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them which are bound. He came to set you at liberty. He came to destroy and remove all of those concentric razor wire fences and all those other things that are barriers to your freedom. And as the cost of freedom in our personal uh, history came at a very high price, so great was the bondage of individuals that there was a high price necessary to secure your Freedom, the very lifeblood of Jesus Christ. He became a curse himself for you. He satisfied every demand of the law. He purchased a possession. And there is no bond slave that he will not liberate. There is no bond slave that he will not liberates. We saw the irrationality of those Jewish individuals that argued with Christ. Do not give in to that irrationality, those excuses, those defenses. The biggest defense, I believe, is that Christ does not promise true freedom. If I become a Christian, I will have to become like all of you folks. Always going to Bible study, going to church, carrying a 10-pound Bible around. I have to say my prayers. I have to wear a tie. Maybe not have to wear a tie. I have to become religious. My friend, True freedom is only found in Jesus Christ. Doing whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, how you want to do it, is not freedom. That servanthood to sin. 
True freedom is only found in Jesus Christ. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Let us pray. Father, we cannot fully apprehend the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, but we know it is total. It is eternal. It is the glorious liberty of the sons of God, as your word says. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who purchased this freedom and having once freed us, delivers us into this field of freedom so that we can live as a child of God, unfettered, unhindered, no longer under any yoke, no longer under any bondage, but free indeed. We thank you and we bless you. Oh, my your Holy Spirit, so work this truth into our minds and hearts that we can apprehend it and understand it and grasp it just a little bit more fully. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.